couple of things. I'm here to actually rejoice in uh, some things that are not so secular in motion. But we're within a month of uh, a national election, a presidential election, along with senators and others. We have for you, if you would so desire one, a uh, Arizona Voters Guide. Um, and these are from the Center of Arizona Policy. And we have used these for years, 20 plus, 25 years, just to give people a, an idea of who people are that are running. What is their voting record? Listen, people can tell you just about anything in a voting election term. While people are running for office, they promise everything. However, they vote what's, what, they vote what's in their heart. So look at how they voted. If they tell you one thing and vote another way, always believe the action. Always. And then I would just simply say to you concerning that, um, it is my opinion both personally and professionally as a pastor, uh, long before I was a pastor, God had moved on my heart to be very aware of my voting because one day I will account to Jesus for every, the Bible says, every jot, every tittle, every word that comes out of my mouth. And when I'm electing other people to go represent me in the most powerful nation in the world, they're speaking in my behalf. I want to make sure that what they're saying is what I believe. And so you be cautious and do your, do your due diligence. That's what this does. It just helps you do due diligence to find out who you're voting for. Now, I recommend strongly I, and I know that there's, I recommend strongly that you vote. Okay? You vote. Don't wait till the last day and say, oh, yeah, I don't know what this is. And then you go check it out. Find out and vote. Listen, we have the greatest nation on the face of the earth. People are still doing everything in their power to get here. We need to honor who we're, where we are and how our forefathers and how, what they've given us. And we need to participate in this incredible republic that is in the form of a democracy. Your vote matters. So make it matter. And that's, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Jesus, in talking to his disciples in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, he said to us that you know, people are always concerned. He was, they were asking him, you know, about just general life questions. And he said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that was in verse 33. All the 32 verses ahead of it was talking about the things that it takes to live life on earth. He said, you put God in his proper place in your life. You seek God and the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And all these other things, I'll add those to you. Now, we've discovered that to be true. And I want you as the people of God to know that to be true. If you want to align yourself and get in line for the blessings of God to overtake you, then by all means, look at Matthew 6 and realize that Jesus is giving his first called disciples a kingdom principle. You want to, you want to know how to walk with God's resources on your life? Put him first. Put his word first. Say, how do you put him first? Well, you put his word first. We just heard this incredible thing we just sang about the, how powerful it is when we are practicing the word. Well, that's how you know how to please God is through his word. Apart from his word, none of us know how to please him. So I encourage you, make, make a participation in your life, a devotion in your life, a practical part of who you are. So you're learning his word here a little, there a little but you're learning it all along the way, and then you apply what you've learned to your life. Amen? That works. Um, still old school, got an offering envelope, and we're not yet receiving the offering by passing uh, our ushers coming by and passing our offering bags um, because we're still we're thankful. I don't know about you. I'm thankful that we have been able to remain open and have church services without the government shutting us down. There are states that have not yet gone back to having church because their, their governors are overreaching with their power and with their authority. 
But I'm here to tell you, I appreciate you, and I appreciate us being able to be here and worship together. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and that's why I would say to those of you who are watching at home, we miss you. And we desire for you to be back with us just as soon as you feel that it's safe for you to do so. We understand why people have had to stay at home, different ones. I get that completely. And we do not in any way look upon you in any other way than just using wisdom. But we miss you. And we desire to see you soon. Amen? Amen. 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 So Cindy and I are still giving. We're still giving the old way. <laughs> but that's what you do when you're old. No, no, no. There's lots of old folks that are giving online, and I'm thankful for those of you that give online. It's very important uh, that it's just a regular part of your life and, and mine. We do have the boxes between the double doors, the metal box there for you to put your offering in, and there's one just outside. If you miss that, somehow get to talking and, and you get through those doors, we've got another one there for you as well for your service. So uh, to God be the glory. How many of you would say... Pastor, at this point and this time in my life, and trust me, because of COVID, we recognize people have lost jobs. They've lost hours on jobs. They've lost income. They've lost a lot of things. But the Bible tells me, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So how many of you would like to have the blessing of God on your life to the place where he's supplying every need. Th then just as we pray, align yourself with that blessing and thank God that it can and can be yours and you can share in it. Father, I'm thankful for your word. Your word guides us and directs us in life. You did say you would supply all of our need according to your riches and glory, not according to our government, not according to the economy, not according to whether or not there's a a crisis in our a medical crisis or a health crisis in our land. But you said you would do it. Lord, there's many of us who have lived this out and we know most certainly, God, you can make a way where there does not seem to be a way. I pray for that blessing to overtake the people of God. I pray for you to be that source of life and strength and resource to the people of God. I pray that you would open up their understanding so that they can come and align themselves in practice and in action with your word. And Lord, I pray that because they do, they will see the hand of Almighty God bringing blessing into their lives. For this we give you thanks and give you praise, for it is in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen and amen. God bless you as we give to the Lord. Hello, church family. We wanted to let you know that the Arizona Voter Guides for the voting season this year is available online at www.azvoterguide.com. You can access it there, or you're welcome to also, we've downloaded and attached it to our weekly email. You can access it through our weekly email. Out at our Mercy House in Cashin, we are super excited because they are beginning to move forward. They resumed adult Bible studies this last week. We are looking forward to our children coming back to meet together to study the Word of God. That will be coming in a few weeks, hopefully. Schools K-8 through out in the Cashin area are resuming on campus October 19th. So in addition to that, or alongside that, we would like to resume our tutoring out there. We are looking to rebuild our tutoring team. If you're interested in volunteering at the Mercy House in the area of tutoring, please get a hold of Mika or Mayana for more information. Also out at the Mercy House, something new that we're doing this year is we're putting together Thanksgiving food boxes to be passed out to our seniors in the community. We will be collecting food all month long up until night, November 15th for items to go into the food box. And then on the 21st, we will need volunteers to come together to build the boxes. And then the Mercy House team will be delivering them into the community to the seniors there. Sign up online if you want to participate. We need to know that you're going to volunteer on the 21st. 
anyone can bring food in and donate for those boxes. Missions has been at the heart of Cornerstone since its inception 34 years ago. We are having our annual missions uh, convention beginning October 18th through the 25th. We'll be having our missionary, Connie Huffer, join us on the 25th along with our Faith Promise Sunday. So be prayerfully considering what the Lord is calling on you to do and commit to this year. October is also Pastor Appreciation Month. We will be setting up a table for you to express your love in your written thoughts. We will have cards ready for you. Please come by, have your children come write their thoughts. We love our pastors here. Help us to honor them this month and express that love to them. You may also give a monetary gift online or through a regular offering. We want to remind you to get connected. We have lots of opportunities for you to do that. Our senior breakfast is coming up on October 10th. We've got our ladies lunch on the 11th. We have photography, shooting, and our biking groups coming up. So get online, take a look, and get connected. We love you guys. We are praying for you. We love to come together each week and pray for our church family. Have a great day. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here with us today at Cornerstone. As you saw on, on, the, uh, on the slides and the, the announcements today, you can follow us on all of our social avenues at cornerstoneaz.org on all our different platforms. A good way to stay connected with us is through our app. We use that through Church Center. And so you can download that app from Android or the iOS, and you can actually download it and plug in for our church, and you'll find out all of the things that are happening there. You can interact with your groups. You can be a part of events and all the things that are going as well as right on the homepage, you can submit a prayer request. And for us, that's a great way for us to be connected with you and help pray with whatever you're going through. I know we use it, like as far as our family, our church, our office, many of you have been using it. And we stop and we pray whenever those, those requests come through. And then collectively as a staff, we pray over those prayer requests every week, as well as other requests that have been shared with us privately, because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer makes a difference. How about you? And because we do, we stop and we pray because we believe not just, oh, I'll think of that. No, let's shut it down and let's pray right now for this thing that's going on. And there's been many times that Celeste and I are in the middle of something or something's going on. And we realize that if we were like, oh, we're talking about it. And if we just keep going, we won't pray because we'll forget. Anybody ever been there? And you meant to do it. So we'll have to stop right then in the moment and be like, okay. Let's sit. Let's pray together. Just pray over this thing. Lord, your kingdom come in this situation. And you, you intervene in this place. And because that's what he asks us to do, that we would be those that would bring those requests before the Lord. So let me encourage you to do so. Stay connected with us on those different platforms. If we haven't connected, my name is Jay. I'm one of the pastors here. You can follow me on, on this is Jay Brown, all social avenues as well. Um, we have been talking about and using this image of what it means to follow Jesus. And I think uh, many people are starting to get this concept of that we are on a journey with Christ. How many people understand that? And because we are, none of us have arrived. All of us are still moving with Jesus. And we have to keep after it in our walk with Christ, that we have to keep growing, keep stretching, keep following where he's leading us to go. Now, for us, we, we express our community in the way that outside of this setting here on the weekend, we do that through life groups, and it's through connect, grow, and serve. And in these three ways, it helps us to really interact with each other. Connect groups are just that, an opportunity for us to build relationship with each other. Uh, yesterday, 
We had an amazing senior breakfast. I get to be there because I helped put it on. So that's why I get to be at the senior breakfast. And I told them so. I was happy. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, Pastor Angus, Celeste did an amazing job of, of providing a meal that was there for them. And we had a great time together. Also, uh, I know a number of ladies that were part of the craft group that was happening on Saturday morning. That was just yesterday. There's a lot of great things that are happening today. The ladies are having a lunch after this service. There's connect groups that you can be a part of. Let me encourage you to get involved, to join a group, to get a part of what's happening. Next weekend, if you want to die on a mountain bike in the desert, join me. Join James. We're going to ride some mountain bikes in the desert. There's all sorts of things that you can do and be a part of. There's some great stuff happening. I was sharing uh, before the kids came up to honor us with those cards, which is great. Uh, about our missions convention. We're kicking it off this next week. Pastor Celeste is going to be sharing and sharing her story and about what our church is doing in missions across the world. We already have had a number of our, the, our partners in missions send videos and greetings to us that we'll get the chance to see. The following week, we'll actually have our friend Connie Huffer, a good friend of ours, someone that we love, someone that we've been and served alongside in the Middle East. She's coming to, to come and share with us. We're excited about that. Our kids are having a special missions presentation. So all the parents that are out there that know the song, you guys can come up front and do the motions as well. No, we're going to have a great time with our kids. We're going to share some songs for us, and it's going to be awesome. So I encourage you to be, propel, uh, pre, be prepared in your heart for compelled, which is the theme that we're going to be going with for that missions convention. And be praying and saying to the Lord, what would you have me do in missions this year? You know, uh, it's, this is beyond your tithes and offerings. This is something that you do out of your heart so that others would know Jesus. And there's something to that. I know even with us coming back and, and having been a recipient for so long, we're always, even as we were gone, we ourselves were those who sent others because we believe in the process. We believe in what happens when people find Christ. And so let me encourage you to do that. Pray and find out. We're excited about our youth going to youth convention. How many people love our students and that all that they're doing? Love those guys. Excited for them. Let me encourage you to get your students to get involved and go. There's still a couple spots left that are there. Uh, today, we are continuing in our theme, Parables, and we're finishing it up this week as we go into Michigan Convention next week. We've been talking about this from Scripture. In Matthew 13, it says, When the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So Jesus is explaining to his followers, listen, I give them a teaching that's a general idea that they're kind of like, what? But to you I reveal behind the scenes on what it means so you can apply it to your life. Verse 16 says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, to hear what you hear and did not hear it. See, for them, they were seeing the revelation of the Messiah, the foretold one. He was there with them. And us being blessed in the backside of that history, Christ already being there for us, we also are blessed, getting to see and understand. Anytime we can pick up the, the scriptures and see the revelation that's there before us. We started off talking about pastor sharing about the leaven and how we got to watch out for these perspectives that will weave their way into our attitudes about being those who are overly, overly liberal, overly strict or materialistic and not let that get to us in our faith and bring us away from Christ. We talked about the kingdom of God and about the, the strength that is in holding on to our faith and valuing it and understanding that if we even have a small amount of faith for the great things God can do, He'll do even more things than we expect. We talked about that with the idea of the mustard seed and having the idea that the mustard seed is something that starts out small but changes and provides for others around it. We talked about with Celeste sharing about the persistent widow and the one who was seeking after justice and would not let go. I want to encourage you to be tenacious after your faith, tenacious after your prayer time with God. We talked about the new things, the new things God was doing, about new wineskins and a new revelation, a new thing he wants to do through you, but you have to be spiritually ready. And if you're not ready, then you will miss the miracle. We talked about this last week, the lost ones, 
and talking about how Jesus goes and he finds us right where we are. Like the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. He comes and he accepts us and brings us back in and doesn't keep us as a servant, but brings us up as a child of God and brings us in close to him. Today we're continuing in, that, in the theme of parables, talking about the good Samaritan. If you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone today, we're looking at Luke 10, and we're going to start there. It says in verse 25, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, verse 30, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend I will repay you when I come back. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this word as you speak to us today. Lord, a revelation that you give to us in showing mercy and being one who is a good Samaritan. Lord, I pray that you would make it alive to us today by your spirit. You would breathe it. It would become pneuma alive to us, the rhema word. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is, a good, is an amazing story. I think many of us have read this, have studied it. I know I've heard some great messages on it in the past. I've preached it before in different places. But here's the thing. Every time I look at this, I think God shows us a different piece of the reflection of what he's trying to share. Um, it jumps off with this idea of this story of a good Samaritan action that I got to witness firsthand in the hearing of the story happen. So when we lived in Paris, uh, I, my French is horrible. My French is still horrible, but at least I was trying to learn it. So we, I was going to school in the middle of Paris at this place, Alliance Francaise, and it's a, clay, it's a place that's taught French since the 1800s, and, and so people were there from all across the world. In, cla- in fact, my class had 10, 11 nationalities just in my small class number. I think there was like 13 of us. And there was all different nationalities that were represented. And so we would every day jump on the train and we would go into the city. And the train, for all of us that live out in the western suburbs of America, you know, being on a train is not an everyday occurrence. You know, in fact, we tell people when we go on a train, like, oh, I went up north and I went on a train. And people were like, a train? No way. Were there robbers with guns? You know, it's like this whole thing, like it's a cowboy movie. But for many people across these big mega cities across the world, like a train is just part of the deal, man. Like you don't have a car. This is your car. And this is how it is in Paris. This is the train in Paris. And you can see it gets crowded. It gets crazy. It gets cramped. You can see this next picture. Everyone is holding on. There's a lot of arms up like this holding on to rails. There's a lot of body odor. You know what I'm saying? There is a reason. I, man, I wore a scarf in France. I wore a scarf in winter. I wore a scarf in summer. I wore a a summer scarf that I would spray cologne on, and I would dig my face down into that scarf to keep from my fellow patrons on the trains wonderful aroma as they ate curry, and they ate other things, and they did not bathe. And I was like, thank you, Jesus, for the wonderful people that made the oils in this thing. And I would breathe deeply into it. And that was the same as I went to school on this day. You know, it's packed, it's crazy, it's crowded. And it wasn't a strange occurrence to see someone get robbed on the train. And it's not the way you think of it. It's not like someone would, like, you know, hold them up or try to beat them up. Most of the time, it's snatch and grab. So it's a lot of purses, a lot of phones. In fact, a lot of times, you would hear there's a, there's a bell that happens right before the doors close. It's a beep, 
and then the doors close. And so you would hear that beep. And as soon as you would, man, you'd have to, you'd have to we'll see if anyone's going to move. And sometimes there'd be someone by the door and they would run and grab and snatch someone's phone and jump out the doors right before the doors close like that. And you're just, you see the per- they can't get off the train and now their phone is gone. And you could see the robber right there. They're walking away with, their, with the phone. And I saw it happen, and I was like, man, I saw people get pickpocketed. I walked up on people, you know, going to the airport or something, and you'd see their whole backpack opened or sliced across the bottom, and you're like, oh, they're about to have a terrible day. And this happened all the time. In fact, one of our good friends, Scott, who's uh, someone we support in missions, he leads Chi Alpha nationally. He told me the only place that they successfully pickpocketed him was in Paris, and he was on the train, and he had his wallet in his back pocket, and he had turned and was talking to somebody. Now, Scott's been in 100 countries over that, and this is the only place they successfully pickpocketed him. Pickpocketed him. They grabbed his wallet, and Scott felt it. He grabbed the person's arm, and the person jumped outside the train door, and he was holding on to the person's arm. And suddenly, this train starts to go. And it starts to go. And, sure, and he, the guy has Scott's wallet and won't let go. And Scott has his arm. And here's coming the end of the platform. And Scott has to make a decision as a missionary pastor <laughs> of grace and love. How bad do I want my wallet? Am I going to send this guy to go see Jesus into the platform? The guy never let go of the wallet. Scott lets go of his wrist. Whoop, in goes the hand. And Scott got pickpocketed. Same story, I'm in class at Alliance Francaise, and we're sitting in a group, and, and these two people come in, and one's my friend Abraham from Israel, and another is a different Canadian girl. And she comes in behind us, and she's like, that was incredible. And, and we're like, we were kind of already talking and using our terrible French, because, you know, we all speak different languages, so we're trying to communicate with each other. And I'm like, what? And a few of us spoke English, and so she starts to tell this story. And she's like, well, man, Abraham, he, he just, he just, man, he's like Superman. And we're like, what? What do you mean? And it turns out that Abraham, who looks like this, he, he's, a, he's a Hasidic Jew. He, he has the hair. He's actually a lawyer. He, he, wore, he wore his, his, his cover every day. He wore the black every day. You know, he looks apart. It was very interesting. He was in gr- group, and so there's people from Pakistan in the group and people from other places that naturally would be enemies of country. But together, we were, we were at peace with each other, learning another language. And this girl comes in, and she's like, well, he, he just jumped in, and he, he, he stopped someone from robbing someone. And I was like, what? And we turned to Abraham. He had come into class like it was no big deal, just sat down, just chilling. And we're like, no way. And she goes, no, no, you don't get it. This woman, this guy runs off the train and snatches her purse and starts running Abraham jumps up in the air and jump kicks this dude in the face (laughs) and gets the the, the purse back and walks it over and hands it back to the woman and then goes to class. And we were like, what's happened? It's like this picture, this next picture. Bah! Like, wow! Like, we were like just looking at him and he's like, like, no big deal. Come to find out, he had been Israeli special forces. Before he was a lawyer, before he moved to France to learn French to become a French lawyer. Incognito, I had like a super Delta Force kind of dude wearing his Hasidic Jew clothes in my classroom who I'd been talking with every day in terrible French. And I didn't know that he was a Superman Samaritan guy. He was willing to put it out there to jump in for somebody else. And man, I love that idea in a story where it picks up and someone is willing to go out of their way to show love to your neighbor. And that's for us today. That's the challenge for us today, that we would love our neighbor, love your neighbor. And it, you know, it was interesting. I, I really went, all, went back and forth on sharing this message or a different one. And I, I had written the other one and felt like I was supposed to share this one because of how divisive our world is today in one fight against this other fight, and we're all the same people, and we're fighting, and we're tearing each other apart, and people hate another person because they align this way, and they hate this person because how can you think this way? And man, it feels divisive that we would be those that show love and be different. Love your neighbor. So it comes in the scene, and you can imagine, as it says there, it says, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. It doesn't sound like a lawyer, does it? 
usually they're pretty kind and kicked back and not argumentative at all. If you're a lawyer, I love you. I'm sorry. The Lord be with you. Everyone I've known that's been a really good lawyer is very argumentative, right? So this is right in line with this idea. And the lawyer in this day knows the law. That's what they know. They know the law of Moses. They know it all the way down. So when Jesus, whenever he tests him, he says, the, the, Jesus is responding to this question. He starts to query Jesus, like, how much do you really know this law? If you're really a, a, a teacher like you say you are, what do you think? And he says, so what do I do to inherit eternal life? Like, what makes me right, righteous before God. And Jesus responds to him and says, well, what do you read in the law? Like, how good a lawyer are you? Right? I love how Jesus flips it on people, right? Do you remember, like, whenever people are like, what should we do? What should we do with this woman who's caught in adultery? And Jesus, like, writes some stuff, like, maybe their names, maybe their home address in the dirt. And he's like, well, whoever has no sin, cast the first stone. I love that about Jesus. He's just always willing to be like, well, what do you think we should do? Here's the ball back to you. And so he says, he says, write what's in the scripture, right? It talks about it straight away. Love the Lord with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. How many people say, yes, Lord, and love your neighbor as yourself? He knows the law. And he said, Jesus responds to him, you've answered correctly. He knows that it comes straight out of scripture. And what does Jesus say that you'll get from it? You'll inherit eternal life. Like, this is what makes you righteous before God, is following the heart of God. Now, notice there's a big difference between following the heart of God and following the law. Now, the law was there as, a, as guidelines for us to help us, because that's what the Lord is saying. Listen, live within these things, and you will follow after my heart. But it was really a heart issue. And so as we see, even in Leviticus 19, where that comes from, in verse 17, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see it in your heart. That's in the law. And so as Jesus is talking about these things, he's getting to the base idea of it. In his own words, Matthew 5, Jesus says, You've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you, so you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It's that thing where Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek, forgive your enemy. And see, that's hard. That's very difficult. It's very difficult because you were wronged for a reason or you disagree with them for a reason, and so therefore you're your enemy for a reason, right? Most of us don't have enemies for no reason. There's usually there's an emotion that's attached to it. You feel pretty passionate about that reason they're your enemy, and Jesus is saying forgive them. Not just forgive them, love them. And you see how difficult that is. And it's difficult because we're trying to do it in our own power. But he doesn't ask us to do it in our own power. But if we come to him and have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the work of the Spirit in our lives, then it becomes something that he does through us and on our behalf. And so that's the difference that's there. That's what it was at work in someone like Stephen whenever he was going and serving and speaking the word of God and prophesying who Jesus was, and it cost him his life in Scripture. In Acts 7, it says this, As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he said this, and he fell asleep. In his last dying breath, he asked the Lord to forgive the people who were killing him for proclaiming the gospel. This past week, I met a guy named Manny, and he came to fix my air conditioning. And this man is a great guy, super nice guy. We were just talking about life. And he shared with me some things, you know, kind of he was going through. And he had been in ministry. Man, great guy. We just had this, this heart-to-heart connection. We started talking about these things. And man, straight away, this thing kind of leaned towards forgiveness, the conversation. 
And, and the reason it did is because I could feel the hurt in him without him even saying it. He wasn't throwing anyone under the bus. He, it could just feel that it was there. And I told him, man, hey, from my own life, knowing it personally, that you got to let go of that. You got to forgive because when you forgive, then you receive that forgiveness you're looking for. And you feel that release and you feel that love that he already knows. He already knows it, but it's a reminder to him. And that conversation was one where, you know, pastor says, will God inconvenience you so that you can bring an encouragement to someone else so you can be a voice to someone else? I would rather not my air conditioner break. You know what I'm saying? But I'm thankful that I got to spend a moment with him and that we got to have that moment because it wasn't just an encouragement to him. It was an encouragement to me that I would not pick up an offense. And you know what? Within two days, I had the opportunity to pick up an offense. It was something old that I felt was healed. You know, I had the battle scar from it. And then I looked down and it was kind of gaping and open and I was about to pour some salt in it because I was back in my emotions, about to pick it back up. And it, I reminded straight away of my own words to this man I just met about forgiving. And man, did I feel convicted. I told Manny, I said, hey man, we just moved back from the Middle East last year and I said, you know, the biggest change for me to come back here was that, you know, people play church in America. And, and in the Middle East, you don't play church. You play for keeps. Because your faith in Jesus might cost you your life any day. People bomb churches. They attack Christians on the way to church camp and shoot them down with machine guns. Stuff happens like that. There was bombs that went off four miles from my house. My friend was in the courtyard where people turned into mist because they believed in Jesus and someone took offense to it. You know, we went to the church camps where people were on their way and got shot down. Here's the thing. If you keep your faith in Jesus as close to you and close to your heart like we've been talking about, then you don't have any problem because it's important to you and you don't have to worry about any of your relationship because you're already with Jesus every day. But if you are keeping Jesus at a distance and he's trying to draw close to you and you're pushing Jesus away, then friend, you are the one that has the problem. And I don't want to be you if something happens in the meantime. Does that make sense? That we would draw close to him just as he wants to work through us. So intentions of the heart. And as you can imagine, the lawyer, he wants to kind of retort. So he hears this thing and Jesus is right. Do that and you'll inherit eternal life. And so what does it say? He wants to justify himself. How many of us have done that? You ever done it with God? You ever done with a friend who's trying to encourage you in your faith with God? They're like, you know, man, maybe not have that attitude. Or, you know, sister, maybe not have that attitude. And you're like, well, let me give you a justification of why I have an attitude. <laughs> and I'm going to give you some of the attitude while I'm justifying it. It's not you guys. It's somebody else I saw in another place. Don't worry about it. It's myself in the mirror. That's the one. Who is my neighbor? You know, I think about all this, um, this unrest and these things that we've been going through. I think about, you know, the riots that were happening in Phoenix. You can see in this, this next image, this, this fighting back and forth, these, these things where people are at odds with each other. There's people who are standing up for one thing. The police are standing up for this other thing, and there's this fighting back and forth. And people are very emotive about this stuff, and they very much feel some on one side, some on the other. Some are torn because they feel both sides. And the thing is, which is pulling us apart. And for us, we would say, well, that person's not my neighbor. I don't even know that person. That's a them, and this is an us. And Christ is talking about being those who see us and not them. Do you see? And so that's why he starts telling this story about a Samaritan. So as he goes into this idea of a Samaritan, he starts unlocking these things for us so that we can understand them. See, Samaritans did not believe the way that Jews did in Jerusalem. They were worshiping in their own way. And in so in that way, they were unclean because they weren't worshiping properly. In fact, whenever Jesus started talking to his own disciples, he said, go to the children of Israel. That's what Jesus sent them out first mission to the children of Israel. And says in that, do not go to the Samaritans. That was later for Saul, comes Paul to do in others as the revelation comes in Acts 10 and we see it through the scripture that goes there. But the mission for Christ and his followers was first to the Jew. And so in doing so, they saw the Samaritan people also as someone who was dirty, also as an other. 
So Jesus, using the example of an other person who actually steps in and shows mercy, was teaching a lesson about otherness, about the way we view people based on some kind of box they fit into, and whether or not they have value, whether or not they're with us and look like us, or dress like us, or believe like us, or whether they don't. And Christ is like, hey, I made people, full stop. And I am the righteousness for people, full stop. And so I'm the one that values people and they have value because they're a person. You get that? And that's a hard one, man, because we want to make it be another and make it be okay to hate. And we want to, ah, man, but that's not what Christ is calling us to do. That doesn't mean we have to agree with what they believe. That's not it at all. Christ is very definitive on this is what the gospel is, and I believe who Jesus is, and that's very okay to do. And I can disagree with someone and still love them. And I can disagree with someone and not okay with their lifestyle and not okay with their choices and not agree with them politically and still love them. See, it says here, what happens at the very beginning? If someone gets robbed, this thing happens to them. They were on a journey, and this thing in life takes them out, and they're half dead. All their resources gone, laying in the dirt on the ground. And so it becomes an issue because the priest comes by first. Now, who's the priest? The priest is the one who makes the offerings before God, right? They're set apart as holy. They're set apart as someone who is the one who has to purify their heart to make the offering before God for the children of Israel. So this priest sees someone who's half dead and they're like, nope. And they take a big step over here. Now, naturally, we in this current day, seeing it in a different way, we'd be like, well, how, how could they act like that? Well, see, in their day, if you touched a dead body, you were unclean. And so they were just seeing themselves as, oh, I got to stay clean. Can't mess with that. Is that guy Jewish? Nope, he's not Jewish. See ya. Peace. You know what I mean? Like, they were making every excuse to get away from the situation. It talks about it in Scripture in Leviticus 21. The Lord says to Moses, say to the priests, the sons of Aaron, say to them, for a dead person, no priest is defile himself among his people except for his close relative, and goes on from there. So the fact is, a priest comes across this person who might be dead, and they're like, nope, not touching him. Bye. And they walk the other way. The second person that's there is the Levite. Levite is those who were set apart of the 12 tribes under Levi to be those who from come the priest. And so an idea of those who take care of the temple. And so it's the same idea. It's a worker in the temple, right? And so they come up, and they're like, oh, no, uh-uh. And they do the exact same thing. See, because they're not motivated in their heart by love. They're motivated by the rules. And see, if you're motivated by the rules, then you just follow the rules. But if you're motivated by love, then you understand the heart of what Christ is trying to do. And that's to love people. And so when he gives this example of this other person who is moved with compassion, you see him as he bends down and starts to clean off the wounds of the, of the, the man who was robbed, it becomes something entirely different. Because something where he's reaching out and in compassion showing love, showing grace. You know, for us that have lived across the world or if you've traveled across the world, there are lots and lots and lots of poor people. People that need help. And they see you as a foreigner, especially if you don't look like them, i.e. me. You know, my wife can kind of blend into almost anywhere we go, right? So we go to, to, you know, Europe, she's from Europe. We go to the Middle East, she's from the Middle East. You know, you go from Asia, she could be Asian. You know, you look at me, not so much. You kind of glow at nighttime. You know what I mean? Like, what's the deal? And so that's the thing. It's like, you know, I always stand out. So there's always these little kids that would come and be looking for a handout. And they're always doing the thing. Here's the deal. Most of the time, even in Egypt, man, they would see you and here they come. And coming at you, coming left, right, center. They're coming for you. You can see in that next image, you know, tapping on the windows, trying to do the stuff. In France, man, everywhere we've been, there's always some kind of scam using little kids. So they use the compassion to love a little kid. And we, we were in Haiti one time, and the kid is trying to steal my wife's wedding ring by holding her hand. You know, in France, they would hit you at the ATM, like you'd see here, where they come up and they ask for something. And meanwhile, the other kids snatch and grab and take your stuff out the backside. Or they have all these other scams that they do. And, man, you get used to them and living in these places. You kind of see it over and over again. It starts to make you jaded in your heart when you looked and you see someone who's asking for help. You know, and here in America, we see things like this. We see these signs, you know, homeless, anything helps. 
And then we also know the story where a person dresses like this, but really they're making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year in handouts. And it, it, it makes us jaded that, man, why, why, I'm not helping this person. They don't even need help, not really. And then you see those moments that are genuine where someone really does need help, like this image here, this gentleman, and it starts to move your heart. And you're like, you know what, maybe they do need help. And then there's the option three, which is people like turn it on its head and make it ridiculous. I love this guy's sign. Family kid backed by ninjas need money for karate lessons. <laughs> Respect to that guy for creativity. You know what I'm saying? This is a man who wants to live under a bridge, and he's like, I can get some money out of some people for some jokes. But here's the deal. You see all this kind of stuff happen, but the real thing is, is that in any context, it's easy to see this as an other. Oh, we need to help them. They're down and out. But what about your sister who needs help with encouragement today? What about the neighbor you have beside you who maybe they're a little rough around the edges, but they need a, a moment of your time, and you're really busy? You see what I'm saying? See, it turns into a sign like this. I used to be your neighbor where our heart starts to be something different. And so when we look back to Scripture and we see the Samaritan here, it says that when he came where he was, he saw him, he had compassion. And so that our hearts would be those that have compassion, that we would be open to what God wants to do in and through us. As we go into a missions convention, that we would have compassion for those that don't know the gospel yet and be willing to take our time and our talent that we trade for money and give some of that so that they can know the love of Christ. It's like this image that we see here where it's the man bends down. It's like, man, this guy doesn't belong to me. He's nothing like me. But you know what? I have compassion on him. Or maybe in a modern day context, it looks like this in a park and it's something else. And I have compassion on them. And so when Jesus asked that question, he says, which of these do you think proved to be the neighbor? The lawyer. The lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy showed him mercy so whenever we look to christ we look to christ as one that shows mercy we look to christ as one that comes and he bandages us up he's the one that wipes off the grime off of our lives he's the one that heals us and he's the one that brings us out of a place of destruction and into a place of life and he asks you to do the same that you would be someone who helps in that process that has mercy on others, especially when we don't agree with them and whenever they don't look like us and don't believe like us, that we would have compassion on them. Does that make sense? I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. Today as we go into our time of worship, it's gonna be an opportunity for you to respond to God and say, Lord, is there anything in my life that's separating me from you? And as we do, we're preparing our hearts because what we're going to do at the end of this song is we're going to take communion together. And so if you're, at, if you're at home and you don't have the elements ready, I encourage you to go and get your elements ready. In just a few moments, we're going to take communion together. But here's the thing. During this moment, answer that question in your own heart. Who are you in the story? Who am I in the story? How am I acting in this story. Maybe you're the person who's in the place of devastation and maybe you need some, a brother or sister come alongside you to realize that you're in that place. Maybe you're someone who's so busy doing, doing the work of God that you're not willing to have compassion when you come across someone like the priest or the Levite. Or maybe you're someone who says, you know, I would be willing to be like the Samaritan. Lord, give me wisdom in the situation so I can be that person that each one of us would answer that question so that we could love our neighbor and be those who make a difference. I'm gonna invite you to stand today. We're gonna pray as we go into this worship song and then we're gonna prepare ourselves to take communion. You know, before we do, the one thing is this. We very much believe that the opportunity to accept Christ is available for everyone every day. And today I would be amiss if I didn't invite you to invite Christ into your life. Maybe you're here today, you've never made that decision to follow after Jesus. The symbol of the cross for us is not one of death, it's one of salvation because Christ paid the price for us on the cross. And when he did, he paid the price for all of our sins and our mistakes. And we accept that sacrifice on our behalf. And because we do, we are seen wa washed clean of our sin 
by the Father. And we accept and we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I invite you into my life, Lord, that you would be the Lord of my life. It says it like this in scripture, because if you confess your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus in his own words says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Give you the opportunity today to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to say that prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I invite you into my life, that you will become the Lord of my life. I wanna live after you. And if you do, today we rejoice with you because that's the life change that you've been looking for. For all of us, that we would search our heart during this time, prepare ourselves before communion, that we would have nothing in our heart between us and God, but that we would instead say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me of where I've grown short. Lord, just as you've forgiven me, Lord, I so also forgive. And Lord, let me be those who love my neighbor. Jesus, we pray this in, name, in your name, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, in this moment, Lord, to forgive, Lord, for, to forgive, Lord, and to overcome these things, Lord, these perspectives we might have in our heart against certain situations or certain people groups or certain things, Lord, but instead that we would love our neighbor. Lord, we would pray for those that persecute us. Lord, that we would be those that even to our dying breath, Lord, would be the love of Christ. But Lord, we know it doesn't come through us. We are but frail people and broken people. So Lord, it has to come through you working in our lives by your spirit. So Lord, have your way in us. Lord, as we come before you in your table today, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul was teaching the church at Corinth. The thing that the church at Corinth had in, in similarity to us is that they were people from all walks of life. And they were people from all ethnic gr groups and races. C Corinth was a, a, a sailor city. It was a city a seaport city. It was a place that ships came and went all the time. And people, some people decided to stay. And it made for a mixture of people from every background. All different kinds of, of customs. All different kinds of religious beliefs. And it's to that, those people that he went preaching the gospel. Ultimately, he raised up a group of followers of Jesus. Disciples of the King. And these people were living amongst people who were just like they had been. So there was a lot of stuff going on always around them. And even in communion, they kind of messed that up a little bit in the church. And in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he brings correction to their misunderstanding. And then he gives us one of the best examples of how to receive the Lord's Supper that we have. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it begins with verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he, had, he was betrayed, took bread. Now think about it. He knows he's about to be betrayed, and yet he still cares enough about his disciples that he, he gives them something that will carry on not only in their life until death, but in our lives until death and until he comes back after his church. On the same night, the Bible says, that, that just still amazes me, he, that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Just hold the wafer in your hand. This represents the body of Christ and let us pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we recognize as we participate in communion together today that, Jesus, you laid your life down for us. That they didn't take your life, you gave it. Lord, we're taught later on that you could have called 10,000 angels to stop the whole process. But you chose not to. You chose to give your life. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you did. We are so thankful that you did. And so, Lord, we recognize that, that our experience with God was purchased in your body and in your blood. Every time we participate in this communion, Lord, we're reminded of who you are and what you were willing to do to connect us to God. 
We give you thanks and we give you praise for that. We're also reminded, Lord, that by your stripes we are healed. And you took stripes on your back, in your body, so that we could know health and wholeness. And as we participate today in this, this bread, Lord, I pray that you bring healing into the body of Christ and that we would experience the power of God and have testimony to share of the faithfulness of God watching over His communion. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the bread together. Paul went on to write, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the cup together and give the Lord praise. Jesus, I thank you that we can participate in this communion. We partake of the cup in remembrance of you, Jesus, your shed blood. And Lord, we recognize that by the shedding of your blood, you broke the power of the kingdom of darkness Hallelujah. off of us. Thank you, Father. You gave us power to face every obstacle in every situation, and you did it, Lord, through your blood. This, rep this fruit of the vine represents the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for the remission of sin and was shed that we might know the power of God to be victorious, yes, overcomers in this life. And God, we pray right now that we receive this into ourselves and we're reminded of your death until you come. Lord, we know you're coming. Your word tells us you're coming. But so do the current events and the headlines of the newspapers. It says Jesus is coming. And so, Lord, we don't just hold the fort. We live our lives focused outward, reaching out with the message of God's love, His grace, and His kingdom. And we give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we go today, a blessing. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. Lord, that you would move by your spirit in our hearts so that we can love our neighbor around us and we can show that love to them. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know this, we love you very much here at Cornerstone. God bless you and have a great week.